everybody. Um, as Daniel's just said, my name's Hannah Redler, and I'm an art curator working at the Science Museum. Might not be the most obvious fit, either with what people think about how science and art fit together, or with what we expect about the Science Museum. I think most people visiting the Science Museum expect to see amazing objects like this, Stevenson's rocket, the first ever passenger locomotive. And they expect to be surrounded by this, loads of kids having a brilliant time, making loads of noise. What they might not expect to see is a tour of cockroaches. And they particularly might not expect to be invited to dress up and join them. A cockroach tour of the Science Museum was the fantastic response from Danish artist group Superflex, who we invited to make a participatory art project in response to our climate changing program. We'd asked them to consider the notion of time and the long view, with the idea that if the human race was a little bit better at taking the long view, we might treat things differently. So they looked back to the species which has been the most successful at adapting, that has been around for millions of years to come and will probably, might well, outlive us. In the tour, visitors, dressed as roaches, get to follow chief roach actors following a script who take them scuttling through the Industrial Revolution as they ponder and think about the apparent human need for speed and time travel. What do visitors think? People enjoy dressing up. They like seeing human behaviour from an outside perspective. They also like coming across familiar objects in ways that seem unfamiliar in new perspectives. So far, so imaginative. And this is surprising. People who come to the Science Museum don't expect to be asked to use their imaginations. They expect to be informed. They expect to be told. But the same people, when they go to art galleries, expect to be called to use their imaginations. Why? Maybe it's something to do with the fact that we know that a lot of the general public feel that science should be presenting incontrovertible truth. They find it uncomfortable to consider the provisional nature of scientific knowledge. So what are we going to do about this? Because this isn't the way we want to present things in the Science Museum. Well, there are lots of things we do, but my role and the people I work with have been bringing contemporary artists into the museum since the mid-1990s as a way to actively disrupt the science stories, to cause a bit of a moment of change. Now, if you're going to make a change to the way people are expecting to find things, if you're going to break the rules and put art where people are expecting to find science objects, you need to give a bit of a clue. And one of the best clues we have at our fingertips, if you like, is the caption or the label. It's quite difficult to decide what to write in 60 words. And one of my favourite labels ever written was written by the artist Marlene Dumas, who made these two portraits. We purchased these two portraits from Marlene Dumas's reject series for our biomedical gallery, Who Am I?, which we opened in 2000. And they originally sat in a case about cloning and now sit in a case about DNA identity, both very contentious areas of scientific practice. She doesn't normally name the reject series, but she called the one on the left the expert, as you can see, and she called the one on the right the experiment. She uses writing in her, in her art as well as pictures, and she said that she really wanted to write the label, and I was all, all for that. And what she wrote applied to both, both works in the first instance. For both, she wrote, Rejects is a series of all kinds of faces, used or abused, for whatever purpose you choose. Everyone likes to read faces. But she gave each of them their own question. Of the expert, she asked, could you trust this person with your life? And of the experiment, what have they done to this person? She provided a response as well, which you can't really call a question, and which you'll see I took for, for my talk title. The response was, we do not know. Dumas's introduction of uncertainty and her undermining of the assumption of absolute truth and authority was a really great element to bring into the Science Museum in the beginning of the noughties when we were very, very actively disassociating ourselves from the Victorian approach of informing and telling people what to think about science and moving to the contemporary approach that we and many other museums and galleries take today of discussing and, dis uh, and, and talking about science with our visitors. Another Victorian model we're currently questioning is the division of disciplines, like this brilliant event. The Science Museum's history is that it came out of the Great Exhibition of 1851 and, like the V&A, started life as the South Kensington Museum. It was a museum that included objects from science, industry, art and design across the board. But in 1909, the non-art collection was gathered, and these are some of the objects you can see in this picture, 
moving across the road to form the new Science Museum. Now, along with all the obvious objects was a really incredible collection of photography. So, what happened there? Didn't the V&A want to keep photography? Well, yes, they did. They also kept an extraordinary collection. And an agreement was made that the V&A would collect art photography and the Science Museum would take photographic apparatus, cameras, and evidence of what those apparatus can do. Evidence. That's photographs. Photographs. So photographs aren't art. Well, they weren't art photographs. Well, actually, they kind of were. So what happened is there was an agreement that some objects, some photographic objects, weren't art at the time. But today, as we look back at that collection, I don't think we're any longer comfortable considering some of the earliest and most experimental photographs ever made to be not art. Because I don't think in our postmodern transdisciplinary world we're quite as comfortable seeing things so clearly in black and white. Fact is, artists and all cultural producers, including scientists, don't stick to these siloed boxes. Culture develops, and indeed the National Photography Collection, which is what our collection is now called, includes all genres of photography today, from fine art, documentary, vernacular, architectural. I mentioned media space, as did Daniel at the beginning of this talk. Media space is our new photography and art gallery, and we just opened it in the second floor of the Science Museum, and we'll be raising all these questions by looking at our photography collections and inviting artists to respond to all of our broader science collections as well. The second exhibition in Media Space opens in um, at spring 2014, and it's called Revelations, Experiments in Photography. And included in it will be this image. It's not a piece of carpet, not a piece of old carpet at all. What it actually is, is an enlarged photograph, one of the earliest photographs taken of the surface of the sun. It was taken by a scientist called Pierre Janssen, who's one of the founders of solar astronomy, and also one of the scientists who is credited as identifying the element helium. It has certain visual similarities with this photograph taken in 2010 by contemporary artist and photographer Trevor Paglin. Paglin works with teams of amateur astronomers to track classified surveillance satellites, which he photographs as an act of counter-surveillance. Both, ph both photographers are interested in using photography to find out more. But Janssen to expand on, on scientific knowledge and Paglin to question notions of power and access to knowledge. In seeing things from multiple perspectives, I think we can agree that truth and reality, even in a scientific context, are subjective, and as such, are always exposed to the potential for change. What I'd like us to consider is that human ingenuity and, and curiosity benefit from this more cavalier disregard of existing structures and systems. Because as we move forward, if we allow ourselves a little uncertainty in what we're doing, in whatever siloed box we think it is, it doesn't matter as long as we are certain that it's interesting. Because that is when change happens, and that is when thinking moves forward. Thank you. <laughs>